Hello, this is Angelica Sagas at the Osteopathy and Healing Center. So today what I wanted to do was continue from the book about Dr. Still's life and what was going on at the time that he lived with people discovering new discoveries and Dr. Still's first postulate. We'll talk about that as well as again talking about how important blood supply is in healing so we left off and now dr still enrolls as a student to the college of physicians and surgeons in kansas city to further his knowledge about medicine and he says in the book that it was a disappointing experience for him why because the school covered material that he's already known and he says the anatomy had a meager outline and the physiology he says that there was a smothering of physiology and the courses in materia medica the science preparation and use of drugs was outlined and really some people have questioned dr still's attendance at the school and some have even doubted that this establishment existed. Nonetheless, Dr. Still, he immersed himself in texts. At the time of Hippocrates, man was regarded as part of nature and nature as part of God. The relationship of man to God, one of microcosm and macrocosm, and that's on page 53. Medicine was guided by the humoral doctrine at that time, and we won't go into detail. You could uh, either research it yourself, or if you read the book, you can go more into detail at that time. Um, but to continue on page 53, he so it says, Health was the natural state of body and mind, to be maintained by living in harmony with one's environment. Through a sensible regime of diet, work, and lifestyle, when harmony prevailed within, right thought and action followed, leading to harmony with nature. Disease represented an upset in humoral balance to be remedied by removal of adverse factors. Medicines, if prescribed, played no decisive role in curing, but simply aided the healing power of nature. So I bring this quote out because it's really interesting how it says that the health of your mind and your body was a natural state that was to just be maintained with living in harmony with your environment so you might think or your patients as well may think about their environment and how their envi environment is impacting their health and it said there through a sensible regime of diet work and lifestyle so again multiple factors play a role in our health and we can look at all these different factors how is my diet how how's my work do i do something constantly for a long period of time is it repetitive is it causing stress on my body you can look at your lifestyle and make lifestyle changes do i eat regularly and is it a pattern do i have a rhythm to it do i have rhythm in my cycles things like that so when you follow a sensible regime of diet, work, lifestyle, then you can maintain your health. To, just to continue, after the Christianization of the Roman Empire, medicine became closely associated with the church. Galen was an unchallenged medical authority at the time. And you can again go more into detail about Galen as well, but I'm, that, that's all I'm mentioning right now about him. In the 1630s, this card spoke of two realms, res externa, sorry, res extensa and res cogitans. And that's on page 55. Again, I'm not going to go into which what one means and what the other one means. Sorry for the mispronunciation, but you could go into detail as well about that. So we talked a little bit about Descartes, and in the late 17th century, Isaac Newton regarded the mind as a unique, a relative, relatively insignificant substance. T 
so these are some names now that I'm just gonna say you could research them more and also in the book it gives you a little bit more detail about who these people were what they discovered Thomas Hobbes Thomas Huxley Descartes William Harvey Frederick Waller Luigi Galvani which we mentioned in a previous video when I believe we were talking about electricity or energy so at this time there was a shift there was a shift in the thinking the realm of matter came overshadowed all other theories and beliefs there was a shift of inquiry from ultimate why of events to immediate how knowledge was no longer qualitative possession of the individual but something external quantitative and exact so in a profession we will look also for qualitative and quantitative signs and symptoms so you know notice here how there was a change in thinking not so much qualitative anymore more on quantitative again going back to Descartes he inspired he was inspired by William Harvey in 1628 he demonstrated that our blood it circulates around our body because of the pumping action of our hearts and this discredited the old humoral doctrine and it eroded the authority of the church so medicine now turned to science for knowledge so this was at the time the doctor still was alive and we can see the different things that were going on in history still learned a system from his father which we mentioned in the previous video was Abraham and he learned that of the influential Philadelphian physician Benjamin Rush and 1768 Edinburgh University graduate and student of Cohen so Benjamin Rush he theorized Adverse stimuli cause hyperactivity of the blood vessels, a state that was called hypertension and exhaustion. Still investigated homeopathy and eclectism, concluding both a conglomerate mess of conjectures and experience on the ignorant sick men. And that's on page 60. So the word life slipped quietly from the medical lexicon. It's on page 62. The church abhorred the new scientific gospel. Genesis taught that God breathed the breath of life and man became a living soul. The body was not the man. Man was only a house of clay. John Wesley insisted, but an immortal spirit, a spirit made in the image of God. And that's on page 62. Methodism had already indoctrinated Dr. Still with this notion of the soul's continuity after death. It did not satisfy, of course, Dr. Still's inquiring mind. And Dr. Still joined the Freemasons, a brotherhood from whom immortality of the soul was a key tenant. He became a master mason and he became involved with spiritualism. Now, spiritualists believed in the soul's immortality and direct communication could be established with the spirits of the dead. So when we're doing an adjustment or OMT, osteopathic manual therapy. If you're intuitive, you may pick up that somebody comes, a spirit, a dead loved one passed, that had passed on with a message to the patient that's important to their healing at that moment. So Doctor Still already was aware of these things because he was a method, he was a method Methodism, and he also was interested in spiritualism he invented things like a churn mm -hmm. 
Sure. So I just wanted to just mention that because Dr. Still was also an inventor, and that's just one example in the book that it gives us of him inventing something. So now, Dr. Still, he meets Dr. John Neal, a physician and a naturalist that prescribed th few drugs, and he introduced Dr. Still to knowledge that would prove crucial to developing osteopathy. Knowledge of the latest literature on natural history, evolutionary biology, and medicine, including the works of Herbert Spencer, Charles Darwin, Ernst Haeckel, Alfred Russell Wallace, and Rudolf Virko. Medicine accustomed to the scientific method. It, it abhorred Virchow's terminology. Virchow said, Cells as vital units in his philosophy new vitalism, words that raise the unwelcome specter of vital spirits or animating forces. And that's on page 68. So the cell theory did not bring the mystery of life closer. It revolutionized the understanding of disease. So Virgo recognized the body exhibits a constant drive towards health. And in a previous video, we mentioned how the body likes to use the least amount of energy so that it can stay healthy. So again, Virko as well realizes that the body wants to go constantly towards this drive of health, going towards health. And he noted in looking at disease under a microscope, foci of healing in tuberculosis and TB. This is what Dr. Still set out to explore and began applying what he learned from his surgical work, right, because he was a doctor, on the battlefield. So with, he noticed with a normal blood supply, and we mentioned this in the previous video, the body possesses a remarkable power of healing, regeneration, and with appropriate hygiene, resistance to infection. Upon this foundation, he formulated his first postulate of his new medicine. An unobstructed, healthy flow of arterial blood is life. Now, yes, medicine at that time recognized that if you have an occluded vessel, it will lead to death of the surrounding parts that is supplied. But Dr. Still here was thinking about partial obstruction to blood flow. And he said, I reasoned that disease, which is really a fractional death, he stated, must be due to partial cessation of bloodstream from some mechanical obstruction to the artery or the vein of the organ that is being prim primarily affected. And that's on page 70. So what Dr. Still did, he went back to find evidence. And how did he do that? Well, he went back to look at Indian burial grounds to look for evidence. And he studied hundreds of specimens, post-mortem specimens, and he reported. I found this to be true in every case. That is, there were some derangement of blood supply, either causing or accompanying all disease processes. With patients, he experimented, he did manipulations to invigorate the circulation of blood to the liver, to the bowels, and other organs within easy reach. And he got some results, he says, he related, but realized that he was only on the first round of the ladder. I had not yet to found the real underlying cause of disease. At that time, cellular pathology, because they were looking under the microscope at this time, gave valuable clues. So Dr. Still, he employed the metaphor of the body as a self-sufficient community. The organs, the tissues, 
workshops for manufacturing products indispensable for the health and comfort of citizens. The cells, a brotherhood of laborers, each performing skilled work. And disease, the failure of a section to perform its task correctly. Just as a filthy sewer will produce disease in the whole city, he paraphrased Virko, so the failure of one organ will produce disease in the whole body. This was a plausible account of how disease developed, but it failed to explain what initiated the morbid changes. He drew upon Virko, who indicated that cellular health relies not only on the quality of the blood, but also upon its quantity. So quality, quantity of blood. In 1840, Jacob Henley, I'm just letting the plane go by so you can hear me. He discovered that our blood vessels have a muscular layer that either decreases or increases the supply of blood. His countryman, Benedict Stilling, termed it basal motor system. So if you are an OMT, you are probably familiar with the vasomotor system. And then 11 years later, Charles Bernard, he severed the sympathetic nerve in the rabbit's neck. So uh, he was doing an experiment and on, on the rabbits and he severed one of the sympathetic nerves within the neck and then he recorded his observations. It caused a state of hyperanemia that ensued in the whole half of the head, hyperanemia. The ears became dark red, the vessels greatly dilated, the conjunctiva and nasal mucosa membrane turgidly injected. That's, page on, that's on page 71 to 72. So Charles Edward Brown, Sequa, he found that electrically stimulating the cut end of the nerve caused the same blood vessels to constrict, and the stronger the stimulus, the greater the contraction. So now Dr. Still writes, nerves were supposed to carry, nerves that are supposed to carry motor impulses to the muscles and to carry back sensations from the periphery. And beyond this, little had he been, had been worked out. He studied the anatomy of the nervous system. And as we're probably familiar with, there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves that emerge from the apertures or the foramina between each vertebrae. So between each vertebrae, there's foramina. These nerves come out, exit through the foramina. Now he noted that only nerves from T1 to L2 give off branches to the sympathetic ganglia. He noticed the T1 ganglia supplies the head, and this one was the one that was severed by Bernard. T2 supplies the neck. T3 to T6 supplies the thorax. And T7 to T11, the abdomen region and T12 to L2 supplied the legs. He also noticed through the foramen past blood vessel, inward to supply the spinal cord. And that's on page 72, 73. 
nourishing the spinal cord as the vital impulses traveled to the cord and to the organs. So, still, he reasoned, he was like, well, then pressure on the motor system or the sensory nerves, motor sensory nerves, things by things like tumors, by things like dislocated bones, by things like contracted muscles and other factors frequently give rise to neurological symptoms. Okay, so if you think about that, if you see your patient and let's say simply their side bent rotated a certain way, okay, and they're constricting that side that their side bending rotating to the nerves and the blood supply that's supposed to be going to feed the organ. So he reasoned here by there's pressure on the motor or the sensory nerves by different factors will cause neurological symptoms. Okay, so let's say we're talking about the sciatic nerve. Let's say that patient is side bend rotated and it's affecting the sciatic nerve. They're going to have neurological symptoms going down the leg. Okay. So he continues to say, similar interference with sympathetic nerves should give rise to symptoms peculiar to that division. He identified the intervertebral foramen as a prime site for such irritation. He theorized that a strained spinal joint by altering the relationship between adjacent vertebrae would narrow the foramen, irritate the existing spinal nerve, and produce motor sensory or sympathetic symptoms depending on which fibers within the nerve were compressed. Two experiences supported his hypothesis. So this is just uh, two experiences that Dr. Still had that confirmed what he was reasoning there. So experience number one, he was traveling on his horse and he wanted to cross a creek and there was a foot long spanning um, tree that was spanning the creek so the, or bark and what happened was the bark detached and then the mule that he was the mule stumbled and he fell to the ground striking his sternum okay so he falls and he strikes his sternum on the pommel of the saddle and then this causes him to have immediate heart palpitations okay so that's example number number one and what dr still then did he thought he would get some opinions from the doctors in the camp that he was working at uh, sorry working that he, he well he was working at at that time so he asked 25 doctors at the camp to examine him and the diagnosis that they came up with was that he had val valvular disease. So Dr. Still, he cured himself. He felt an ache in the upper back and he placed a wooden ball used in croquet um, close to croquet croquet uh, close to a tree so he puts his ball close to the tree he lays down on his back with his feet up on the tree trunk and the ball between his shoulders and he just twists around a little bit and he feels something slip and he realizes his backache has disappeared and his heart palpations never returned so that's on page 73 and 74. So I'm going to just uh, end off there. I hope you enjoyed that. That was just some little history about getting to know what was happening at that time with Dr. Still. Some of the thoughts that he, he might have been thinking because of all these different discoveries that may have been going, that have been going on um, at that time in history and how he came about forming his first postulate and if you remember that that was an unobstructed healthy flow of arterial blood is life so next time when you go and you approach your patient think about that that arterial system that is so important for life for health and it has to be unobstructed it has to fro flow Free, freely to the different organs or muscles or to the spinal cord that it's supplying in order for the patient to feel healthy.
And that's what we do as osteopathic manual therapists. We take out that side bend and that rotation and take off the pressure that's causing on the nerve or the blood vessel and allow blood, to, oxygenated blood to flow to the body and to the organs so that it can nourish it, so that it can heal. And same thing with the veins. When you're unobstructing something or you're taking off the, the pressure on that side of the body, you're also allowing the veins to tend to take away the toxins away from the body and, and also it helps with um, less edema in the body. So it's very, very interesting how Dr. Still came to reason as he did and through his own experience he was able to determine some of some of these these postulates or um, beliefs that then developed the system of osteopathy. So I'll finish there. Thanks for tuning. Have a good day. Bye bye.